virtual summits are the most powerful online marketing tool available to grow your list, launch your platform, make more money, and create an impact in the world, even if you're just getting started. If you are ready to take your summit to the next level, then tune into the Virtual Summit Podcast with Dr. Mark T. Wade. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark T. Wade, founder of Virtual Summit Software and creator of the One Day Summit Formula. And I'm on a mission to help you, the summit host, get your summit out to the world in a powerful and impactful way. So let's get started. Hey, summit host, Dr. Mark T. Wade, your founder of Virtual Summit Software and your host, on the Virtual Summit Podcast. I am super excited for today's episode because we're going to be talking superheroes, gamification, 50,000 lead launches, and a lot, lot more on today's episode on the Virtual Summit Podcast. And I am super excited to have Marisa Murgatroyd with us, founder of Live Your Message, who turns everyday entrepreneurs into online superheroes. She went from artist to mid-seven-figure online business and used gamification to do a seven-figure launch. She's been featured on the Boston Globe, Entrepreneur, Yahoo Finance, and more. I'm so excited to have you with us here today. Thank you, Dr. M.T. Wade. (laughs) I'm excited to be here. It's going to be so great. We're going to be getting into some super specific information on your summits, which absolutely crushed it. And actually, pretty revolutionary in a lot of senses, kind of set the scene, set the standard for a lot of the, uh, the summits that we're seeing happen right now. But before we really dive into that aspect, why don't you just let the summit host listening in know just a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I right now am fascinated and completely obsessed with how to get people so addicted to achieving their life goals that they're willing to bust through any challenge and do the work. So I've been really obsessed with how do you reinvent online education around the world to make engagement and results become the norm and not the exception. Because something like 97% of people who sign up for online programs and trainings and courses and summits actually make it through and get their results. So that's really my obsession right now because when you can get people obsessed with their life goals and getting as excited about changing their lives as they are on you know, surfing Facebook or Instagram, oh my gosh, the world will change. And the world is changing and you're, you're playing a big role in that. And actually it all started, or at least there was a good, good little blip of that start happened back with some summits. So why don't we kind of like take a little time travel back to your first summit and kind of set the scene of what that was and, and, and lead us through that process of the summit series that you ended up uh, hosting. Yes. So I started off doing summits in 2013 and I went from 2013 to 2015. I did five online summits under the brand Superhero Summits and they were pretty revolutionary at the time. And with each summit, we were doing about 10,000 opt-ins and $100,000 in sales. And these five summits put my name on the map and it grew our list to 50,000 people. And when I first started in 2013, I think I had about 3,000 people on my email list. No one knew who the bleep I was. And trying to line up these big summit guests and you know partners, I was like coming from square zero, it felt like. And I was able to, on my very, very first summit, land some pretty big names, you know, Andy Jenkins of you know, Video Boss, and then ultimately Kajabi. I landed James Wedmore, Don Crowther, uh, a lot of really big names there. And this is from someone who had no reputation and no email list whatsoever. And what I did was create a very unique theme and a very unique hook to the summit. So what happens is so many people are doing summits as a way to build their list, grow their tribe, grow their audience. And so many people are doing summits that kind of sound the same as all the other summits. And a lot of people know that summits, at least people who you might want to be a partner, are summits are oftentimes just a thinly veiled list build for the host. And for someone who's got a big email list, I'm invited to summits all the time. And they all sound the same. I want you to email to your list two times and 
you're going to get the honor of being in front of X thousands of people. And a lot of times people exaggerate the number, like 250,000 people, my combined, you know, my combined partners have lists of 250,000 people. But of course, you know, the percentage that actually click through to the summit might be 5,000 or 10,000. And if I'm going to kind of send an email to all of my list about a summit, it's really got to be worth it to me. So I created a model that was worth it, worth it to my business, worth it for my partners, and also worth it for the participants, and stood out like a beacon among all these other summits that sounded identical. It's time to up-level your summit game and interview like a pro. No one wants to listen to 20 to 30 hours of boring interviews. The summit interview is one of the most important aspects of your summit, and now you can get some free training over at interviewlikeapro.com. That's interviewlikeapro.com. Your audience will thank you and your speakers will love you. Let's commit to no more boring interviews. It's time to interview with impact. So it started with the hook, a theme, an angle from making the summits interesting and thinking not just about a single summit, but about a summit series so I could rinse and repeat and leverage the asset that I built summit after summit after summit where they could be gaining momentum and gaining results rather than having to reinvent the wheel. So originally, I didn't even think I wanted to do a summit, but someone came to me and asked if I wanted to do a video marketing summit with them. And I was like, yeah, maybe if we have a really good idea. And at first we were going to call it like video marketing 2013, right? Sounds so boring and it sounds like many other summit names. So I just started to kind of reflect and gestate on how do I make this more interesting? And I came up with the idea of the video superhero summit. And the idea was to turn all the presenters into superheroes. And I found this great artist overseas and I had him actually in advance draw all the people that I wanted to invite into the summit as a superhero. So I drew Andy Jenkins as this like, you know, er, with an ax kind of gladiator guy. <laughs> and, you know, I drew different participants as, um, as the actual superheroes. And I sent them the superhero as part of the invitation. And I did a custom audio invitation for each one of them with, you know, Superman music in the background and invited them personally to join us on the summit. And I created like exclusivity. So each person on the summit had a different topic related to the theme. And I got massive uptake in the summit. And a lot of people said yes, that I couldn't imagine getting who were major heroes of mine because the angle of being turned into a superhero and getting this really cool piece of artwork was so unique that it became worthwhile for them. And I have to say that some of the people I had on that very first summit, I think Jason Flavlin, a rapid crush was one of them. He still uses his Superman character to this day. So people really wanted these characters. It was interesting for the, um, the, the, like the presenters to be turned into a superhero. It got to the point that after three of these summits, I had all these people coming to me. When are you going to have me on one of your superhero summits? When am I going to be turned into a superhero? I want to be the silver surfer, whatever it happened to be. And so I had all of these people, big names coming to me, asking to be on these summits, which is kind of a reversal of the model where you go out there and beg and plead to get someone to be on your summit. So it was a huge success. And this whole brand of superhero summits was something that people started to rip off. Soon you have these business rock star summits with people turning people into rock stars and things like that. But really ours maintained a certain you know, level of credibility and prestige, partly because the artwork was so good. Even though I only spent about $30 per character, the artwork was just like Marvel Comics good, you know? And um, that made a huge difference, especially in the presenters wanting to get themselves as a superhero and use a superhero. It's such, I mean, that's just such an original, unique angle. I, I don't see how anybody could say no. If you, you, you approach somebody like that, that, you know, there's all these ideas and topics out there on how to get, you know, how to get through to somebody to, you know, to get them to listen to you. There's send the video message, send them a little speaker gift or send them something like, I mean, I couldn't imagine if I got all of a sudden there's this image of me drawn into a, a superhero. I'm pretty much like, whatever you want, let's do it, you know? So that's awesome. But it didn't stop there. I mean, your mind is constantly thinking outside of the box. It's one of your amazing genius creative talents. Um, so, and you've actually taken it from the, the summit and it's, it's a part of the, what you do every day with every entrepreneur, essentially. So let's kind of talk through, since you've had so much success, 
with your summits? I mean, you, I think you said you generated around 50,000 leads from your summits, right? Yeah, over the course of the five summits, it might not have been, um, I built my list to 50,000 largely because of the opt-ins coming from the summit, but we would do about 10,000 opt-ins per summit and make $100,000 per summit. So it was solid. And can you, can you talk us through it just a little bit, like pick your, your most recent one that you did and what was kind of the, the, the layout of it? How many days, how many speakers and yeah. kind of what it was, was it free to opt in? What was the upsell? Just walk us through the format of it. Yeah. So I did five of them over the course of the time. We started with the video superhero summit. We did a, um, I believe it was like a traffic superhero summit. We did an online business superhero summit, an author speaker coach superhero summit and a social media superhero summit. Now I'll say that the best ones were um, the video because it was so specific and traffic. I discovered with the Social Media Superhero Summit, it might have just been because it was like 2014, 2015, that there weren't that many people in social media who also understood conversion and could drive traffic. It might be different today than it was then. With the Author, Speaker, Coach Superhero Summit, I think I made the huge mistake of trying to serve too many masters with that summit because authors, speakers, and coaches are three different markets. And if I doubled down on one, I probably would have done better than trying to you know, share a summit across three topics, which is kind of one of the um, core principles because I teach a methodology for product creation that applies to marketing and summits as well called the experience formula. And the very first principle is mission. And a mission is exactly what people are going to do, be, feel, have, overcome, or achieve through a particular offer. And that includes a summit. And I think the big mistake of most summits is you've got 20 people or 30 people talking about the same thing in similar ways, and there's no real outcome, for example. So say with the Video Marketing Superhero Summit, I could invite people, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to understand 10 unique perspectives on video marketing and choose the one to three that you can leverage right away in your business to start gaining more leads, sales, and engagement, right? That would then give people a purpose for going through the summit versus just overwhelm. So you want to kind of be specific on what the transformation is when it, with your summit and also what the theme is. So there's a reason for people to attend and attend multiple sessions versus just go for the one that they really want to see. And so another way that we did that is we kind of innovated the playbook, you know, because this is 2013 and it sounds like stuff that people are using all the time here, but at the time it wasn't. So we created it kind of on like one of those passports that you get um, with stores. So for example, every single person, when they opted in, they got a playbook, which was a, which was a whole cartoon. It was like an infographic on their session. And so part of the playbook was revealed for each person. It was, you know, crazy artwork for each one of these, but they had to come to the session to get the full graphic, which was the full framework that that person was teaching. So this idea of kind of completing the playbook along the way by attending sessions and only getting the actual, uh, additional full graphics unlocked, you know, when you went to the session itself. So we did things like that, that would kind of gamify the summit and drive completion. At the time, most people were doing telesummits. I know this sounds so old school right now, but they were using like, you know, telesummit software. And we did the very first summit on Google Hangouts on air. And it was so like, you know, it was so kind of primordial back at that time that you had to, I, we had to hire someone to kind of connect this to that, to this, to that. And it was unstable and all kinds of potential issues. But we were the first summit using live streaming Google Hangout on air so people could see the audio, hear the audio, see us live in video, also show the screen and have the live chat roll at the same time. So we did live summits. So every summit was live. I did one person a day over, um, 12 days with the break for Saturday and Sunday. So Monday through Friday and Monday through Friday, I just did one session a day. And then the replay would go for about 48 hours after that. And that was the core model. And people would actually sell on these um, summits. They would do preview webinars, but for a product that was $200 or less, and oftentimes it was a product that was normally $1,000 or $500. So it was kind of this app sumo model as well, where they would deliver a really valuable content webinar style and sell at the end, but people would get a very good discount for being there on the line. And that's one of the reasons I was able to make a hundred grand per summit. I wasn't just relying on sales 
of the summit, you know, recordings, but I was getting affiliate commissions from all the different presenters. And that also made it worth it for them because they had a chance to sell their products too on the summit. So with that, I mean, this, I'm, I'm just over here taking notes because there's so much gold just pouring out of you right now. With, with that, when you had the, the speakers or you allowed the speakers to sell, how did you kind of pre-frame that in order to make sure that it was still delivering high quality content, but still a profitable or, you know, a highly converting session, let's say? Well, I mean, because each of them had a distinct topic around the core theme of video marketing, you know, people could still get this crash course on video marketing. So for example, Jason Flablin at the time did something on uh, Google Plus, and that was really big. I think it was YouTube or something along the lines of that. Everyone had a different angle. So when the people were coming and participating, they didn't really mind the sale because they were getting so much value on this topic. They were almost getting like a whole product in and of itself on the topic of video marketing, whether they bought or not. So I, there wasn't an objection at the time for that. That's, that's just extremely creative. I love that. So we've gone, we've gone in through the mission. Okay. We're exper- you know, we're, we're learning how to do be have what's another aspect of the gamification or the experience formula that we can apply towards summits. Yeah. So, you know, part of it is what I call, um, you know, one of my principles is peak emotional experiences. And the opposite principle is mental paralysis where it's just a lot of information. So how do you make the summit more experiential, more fun? You know, whether it's embedded in feedback loops, which is one of our principal, you know, and feedback loops is different from everybody being anonymous. You know, we actually had the audience participation doing these live. So we were able to engage the audience, ask questions, do giveaways on the summit to a live audience. And that made it a lot more experiential than just sitting there and listening to pre-recorded content later on. Um, but when you think about that, like, how can you defy expectations? It's so funny because I was coaching someone and they were like, well, Marisa, I don't want to do any webinars because I'm a dancer and I'm kinesthetic and I can't sit still for an hour. And I was like, what the hell makes you think you got to sit still in order to do a summit? I mean, if you think about it, you could do a summit where everyone is standing and you could be moving and you could be teaching like, a, you know, a, a movement summit or a somatic leadership summit where you're moving and you're not just sitting there kind of talking into the mic. When you think about having this box, right, which is our frame, what you can do in the box is, is awesome. I remember I would come into the summit doing things like uh, I have this, um, Kind of strategy for where to put the, the camera. I like to put the camera in the part of the house with the greatest amount of depth, whether I'm doing a webinar or I'm filming. I used to be a documentary filmmaker. And that involves, um, when you do that, you all of a sudden have the environment to play with. So I'd be wearing my superhero suit. I'd have a spandex suit that I wore in all of these sessions. It got a little stanky after five summits. I got to admit, like this thing doesn't wash very well, right? So I also bought it on Amazon for like 25 bucks too. So anyway, I was wearing this superhero suit and I would actually come in from off screen, sorry, and to, um, into the background and like jump over the furniture and then come on to set. So it was like I was making a superhero appearance. I've done things with wind machines and all this stuff because you can still do this in a frame, right? So if you think about it as entertainment where you're not just, or edutainment, you're not just presenting information, but you're creating peak experiences that have people want to watch and say, what is she going to do next? I mean, I've done stuff on live streams during product launches, for example, where um, I sent all of my presenters animal ears, right? And I sent it to them in the mail. So everybody was wearing different kinds of animal ears. And, you know, you turn up and, you know, this was like a five hour stretch and you didn't know what each person would be. And it was just like one of those things that provided great screen grabs later on, great social media stills, you know, just that unexpected, what are they going to do next kind of thing, right? So, and also even using sets, like I had a whole in the live stream, I did this, um, you know, I decided to put a life-size elephant, inflatable elephant in the background. So I got this seven foot tall elephant and I could make elephant in the room jokes and stuff like that. And I got a jungle theme. It was like experience products in the wild. So I did this whole theme. There was, an, a, you know, a zebra and an elephant. And then my husband would come in in a kangaroo suit and kind of hold these flashcards. Um, and the flashcards were basically for awarding the prizes. 
So we would award prizes every single hour because this was a live, you know, a live thing. And then at the end, we'd have this grand prize package for whoever could put all five of the words that they saw from these flashcards into the chat box as quickly as possible. And we had people staying hours and hours because of this thing, right? Because they wanted to win, but they didn't know when something new or unexpected was going to happen. So this idea of peak emotional experiences and getting out of the mental paralysis, which is just normal content presentation can be carried to extreme, you know, things with wardrobe, costume, props, you name it. Like what you can do in this frame is pretty extraordinary. It's time to up-level your summit game and interview like a pro. No one wants to listen to 20 to 30 hours of boring interviews. The summit interview is one of the most important aspects of your summit. And now you can get some free training over at interviewlikeapro.com. That's interviewlikeapro.com. Your audience will thank you and your speakers will love you. Let's commit to no more boring interviews. It's time to interview with impact. This is, I don't even know what to say at this point. I don't think I've ever been speechless on this podcast before, but this is just so much gold. Um, and I'm right now picturing your husband in a kangaroo suit too. So there's that going on as well. <laughs> and he had a little Joey too, like a little Joey in the kangaroo suit. And I swear, like he, we, we have these um, animal onesie parties at our team retreats and all our team wear, comes in animal onesies. And I remember doing a house in Lake Tahoe and there's a stripper pole to see all these animals on the stripper pole was hilarious. And everybody would just, you know, fondle my husband's Joey. And he's like, you can't do that without permission. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. This, this is it gets stripper pole and uh, animal onesie. This is just too much. So let's keep moving. We've got, we're going through your, this, this experiential formula right now, peak emotional experience. You said the opposite of that was again, one more time. Mental paralysis. Mental paralysis. Okay, so let's keep working through this. This is, this is gold. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those are some examples of things that we did. I was talking about leveraging feedback loops and leveraging community. Now, that's a lot easier to do when you're doing live summits. And I was doing a live summit model with replays. It's a little bit trickier for the presenters. But when you can have an audience to respond to, I think it's a little bit more interesting as well. Of course, if you're doing multiple you know, sessions being released every single day, it can be trickier, but then you can engage people, you can incentivize them, you can run contests, you can do a lot of things when you've got that live audience. But even if you don't have a live audience, if you think about ways to have feedback loops, whether it's someone asking a question of a particular presenter and then whatever it is or an awarding like that person who asked the best question or has the biggest insight. There's ways that you can do it to actually have a two-way stream of, of, of information and of content. That's basically, um, what's the word, crowdsourcing some of your content and some of your engagement. So the opposite of feedback loops is anonymity, where people are just going through this contest or sorry, the summit funnel, and there's no way for their, their voice to be heard or for them to, like I say, change the summit through their participation in it. And giving people opportunities to do something like that is really revolutionary for them. It gets people more excited to consume content, to share it. Yeah, I mean, and, and unfortunately, that's how a lot of summits are being run right now, just out of, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot more summits being run right now is because it is becoming easier and less difficult. We have, you know, software like our software, Virtual Summit software, which allows you to quickly and easily put on a summit, but then we do lose a little bit of that kind of the feedback loop like you're talking there. So what are some other kind of ideas or takeaways or ways that we can gamify the summit. Let's look at it from this, from a non-live summit, just because a majority of virtual summits are not live. They're pre-recorded. So what are well, some... Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, you could do some kind of audience engagement piece for every session. So even if you are kind of pre-recording everything before they become released, you could let people know ahead of time that you're running a summit and then you can run some kind of content for user contributed, like contest for user contributed content related to very specific, you know, uh, sessions or themes in general. And you could do some kind of user contributed nugget within each one of them. So, for example, um, you know, if you go to a mastermind like War Room, they have this wicked smart panel, right? And a wicked smart panel is if you were doing a traffic superhero summit is tell us your best traffic strategy 
And you know, if you if you're on, if you get it, you're gonna uh, we're gonna feature you on the air, and also. Um, in addition to featuring you on the air, we're going to give you, you know, a summit recording pack for free, right? And you could choose one every single day. And then you throw that in as an audience engagement thing. We went, my husband and I um, saw some podcast that was recorded live the other day at a theater. And it was this big thing. It was about movies where they're just dissing movies, really bad movies. And I can't remember the name of the podcast. It's famous. They filled this gigantic Wiltern Theater in Los Angeles for a podcast recording. And at the end of this recording, you know, for a podcast, which is normally this, you know, thing like what we're doing here, uh, they did all this audience engagement stuff. So they have this theme song and they let people come and sort of sing their theme song in different ways up on stage. And so they were doing all of this stuff. People were, they were doing user contributed t-shirts. So every time they recorded a podcast, they would do a new t-shirt for that podcast and they would vote on something that was in that podcast that was the most noteworthy for a t-shirt, you know, that people would want to buy. So they were doing all this kind of engagement stuff related to a podcast, even though ultimately the vast majority of people were going to see this later on pre-recorded, right? So, and they would create crazy artwork of, you know, the, the, the kind of hosts of the podcast and film posters and things like that, and just do you know, really fun, really creative, really out of the box stuff just by dissing really bad movies, basically. <laughs> that, that's great. And so we can use this in our summits right here. I mean, using, getting user feedback per sessions, letting the, 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 the attendees know in advance what's going to be happening, what's going to be uh, going through. I don't think I've ever seen somebody actually take people from their summit, the attendees, and then feature them. And for example, we do hybrids where most of the summit is pre-recorded, but on the front end and throughout, throughout, and then on the back end, we'll do some live sessions and actually bring the attendees and feature them live on any of those sessions. That, I mean, that right there could stimulate and get, get some engagement and people moving. So all of this is yeah. really And even pertinent. if it wasn't pre-recorded and you launched it, say it was a two-week summit, and then you had the closing you know, session would be, uh, what I, I always talk about my last principle in the experience formula, and there are 10 things to do and 10 things not to do, is mission accomplished. And maybe the mission accomplished you know, session is a session that you do live as a webinar, and you pick the 10 best user contributed content, and you give each of them a five minute cameo, right? And they become the rock stars of what they've learned from the summit or whatever it is that they've created in the summit. Or maybe there's something that they're supposed to do from day one to the end of the summit and the people who've had the biggest wins doing that thing. And that would be a great place to branch off into say a next step offer. So you celebrate everybody and then you might offer them the next step on the journey, but they've actually completed something. You kind of combine in some ways like a summit and a challenge, for example. That, that right there really resonates with me because we actually teach uh, the summit story arc and we use the summit storyboard to actually map out a summit. So it takes the attendees on a journey versus just having a bunch of random sessions talking about yeah. different things. So I love how yeah, it's so taken- Why not have a finale mission accomplished one where, you know, that you're kind of featuring people who've been a part of the summit. And then, you know, it's kind of like Avengers Endgame, right? Where everyone's got a little cameo. Yeah, no, this is great. So uh, we're getting close to the end of this episode, but I mean, there's so much great information pouring out of you. Let's let's go with maybe one or two more kind of tips or topics that are that are on your mind when it comes to summits. And actually, we were talking in our pre-interview chat how you were um, helping somebody uh, recently with a summit, and you were giving him some advice on how to advertise and market it. So I mean, maybe we can talk about that, or just anything that's on the top of your mind that our summit host can walk away with. Yeah. So one of the core principles that I teach on how to um, really create super sticky products and summits and marketing is the principle of constant wins. So constant wins is how do you create a game people can win? How does you make it feel like every single time they interact and engage with you, they're winning? So for example, even if you want to like data hack sales, um, a lot of people don't know that if you can get people to do three things, they're way more likely to buy from you than if they are not taking action. So if you can look at, is there a step as part of this, say, story arc, where there's also an action arc or a call to adventure arc, like a hero's journey that they're taking, where there's things that people are doing with every session that you could map out in advance, then all of a sudden, they're not just consuming sessions, they're taking actions from the sessions. 
right? Then all of a sudden you're creating the summit in a way that there's these constant wins embedded in it. And there's a much bigger reason for them to go session to session versus just sampling whatever they might be interested in at the time. Does that make sense? But yeah. I mean, that's great. I like that. The action arc paired with the story arc. Yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep rocking this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, those are some of the, the principles I would recommend. You know, I, I talked about mission. I talked about constant wins. I talked about peak emotional experiences, feedback loops, community, and mission accomplished. And I've got 10 of these principles. The other thing that I wanted to mention is the principle, which is uh, core experience number nine in my formula, which is unstoppable momentum. So this is the idea, like you talk about the story arc, but how do you get people into momentum through the course of the summit? So a lot of times what happens with summits is, you know, your first session gets the most hits and the most watches, and then there's less engagement from that point on. How do you actually build momentum through the summit? Like I said, if there is an action people are taking or that action arc, how can you ramp up actions from maybe very small, simple actions that anybody could do? And these don't even have to be delivered by the person you're interviewing. It could be ones that you have as almost Easter eggs in each episode and then ramp them up to bigger actions and bigger rewards. How can you build this unstoppable momentum that has your summit become more engaging as it goes on rather than less engaging? So how can you build momentum in the audience as they watch your summit? Because the opposite principle of that, because each one of these, like I said, um, experience escalation principles that you can put into marketing or product creation or summits or whatever it is, has an opposite principle that creates what I call the downward death spiral, where people start to decelerate, get frustrated, get bored, walk away, where a series of basically unconscious choices that the summit creator or the product creator makes has them start to lose momentum and lose motivation. So the opposite principle is this idea of starting and stopping, right? Starting and stopping. So how do you create this momentum that goes from episode to episode to episode or session to session to session versus so that the summit itself has that like integrity to it, has those arcs to it versus thinking of, okay, a summit is a collection of speakers and presentations. So I recommend you think about the whole in that way and you're kind of framing the journey of the whole. So you're creating that future self vision for people of what will their life look like after the summit is over. And I don't think a lot of people think about their summit in this kind of meta way, this experience escalation way. So it becomes something that's much more engaging and much more hooky than just a series of sessions of people talking about the same thing in slightly different ways, which is what I see in most summits, which is why I usually don't accept invitations. It's time to up-level your summit game and interview like a pro. No one wants to listen to 20 to 30 hours of boring interviews. The summit interview is one of the most important aspects of your summit. And now you can get some free training over at interviewlikeapro.com. That's interviewlikeapro.com. Your audience will thank you and your speakers will love you. Let's commit to no more boring interviews. It's time to interview with impact. Yeah, no, and, and that's so true. And, and, and what's like one or two big no-nos that you're seeing a lot, like very commonly done in summits? I know we've talked about, you know, not the, the things we need to do, but you're seeing these and it's probably like nails on chalkboard for you. So like what's one or two things that you're seeing commonly done on summits that's, that's just a big no-no not to do? Well, it's kind of like you're asking this, every presenter the same questions when it's interview style. And it just feels like stock answers to stock questions. As they say in the, the film world, garbage in, garbage out. So if you ask kind of semi-garbage questions, you might be getting garbage responses versus, you know, more depth and something that's a little bit more interesting from the participants. And especially if you're having like 20, 30, 40, 50 guests, the same question is going to get a little bit boring along the way. That to me is a big no-no, right? I think the other big no-no is, um, you know, it's interesting. I think that because the goal of so many of these summits is to build the biggest list possible for the summit host, you might see like 30 or 40 sessions and it's just a lot. It feels overwhelming for someone to make that kind of commitment if it's not worthwhile. So I think that having a more curated experience can actually be more valuable than just the kind of um, you know, blunt force approach to how many people can I get on the summit to talk about the same thing in a slightly different way? 
It's so true. And that, I mean, that's why I'm a big fan of the one day summit, anywhere from five to 10 speakers, get a single, solve a single problem with a specified amount of time. So this has been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I kind of wish we could just continue to pick your brain for hours. Um, But I know you've got other things you need to get to as well. So as we wrap this up, if you could just let our audience know, because I know they're going to want to follow up with you. They're like, this is so much gold. There's still, there's still more to be untapped. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? And is there any other golden goodness you want to throw their way? Yeah, yeah. Well, the best way to get in touch with me is I've kind of created this checklist of the 10 core principles to create that experience escalation. I often teach it in the context of product creation, but I also teach in the context of marketing and the 10 core principles to avoid if you don't want to create the downward death spiral in your summit. So if you want to go to liveyourmessage.com forward slash summit, you can grab that checklist. And I highly recommend putting it to use if you want to have that kind of summit model that can become an asset that you use you know, over and over and over again in your business that you actually can get the top presenters to say yes. And you can get a lot of audience participation, opt-in, mounting interest and engagement and momentum as you go versus dwindling interest and things like that too. So definitely go to liveyourmessage.com forward slash summit. And I like to end with something that I always tell people, which is you can have everything you want in life if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. And that's a famous Zig Ziglar quote, a motivational speaker. And I think that it's so easy to think about what you want to deliver, the experience you want to deliver, the summit you want to present, but what are people going to benefit from? So put yourself in the shoes of both the presenters you want to come on board and the audience and not just your own perspective of what you want for your business model. Because so often when I'm getting these invitation, it just feels like a list grab. There's not a clear value proposition for the audience and there's not a clear value proposition for the presenters. So it's like this list grab for the host and I don't want any part of it. So how can you put yourself in the shoes of both the presenters that you want to have say yes to you and the audience that you want to opt in and consume the the summit to engage with your material? And then really design your summit from that place and it will change everything for you. Marisa, this has been so phenomenal. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, All you Summit hosts listening into this, thank you for taking the time to be here with us as well. I'm Dr. Mark T. Wade, founder of Virtual Summit Software, and your message matters. Make sure you check out the show notes, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Now, don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on the Virtual Summit podcast. Head over to the show notes to check out all the links and resources from this episode and be sure to grab your free trial of the Virtual Summit software. Now, I want to end this episode by saying to all the Summit hosts listening right now, I believe in you and you can do this. Summits are by far one of the most powerful ways to quickly grow your list, launch your platform, make more money, and most importantly, make an impact in the world, even if you're just getting started. So don't get caught up in analysis paralysis because the world needs to hear your message and there are people who are waiting for you to help them. So just get started because imperfect action is always better than no action. Thank you and see you on the next episode.